Welcome students to the first lecture, official lecture of investment modeling. And like I said before in, intro, in the introduction, we want to basically take what we talked about in, in the introduction, the topic about compound returns, passive investing, specifically your education, your tuition, and we want to basically calculate the compound return around it. All right, and we're gonna, and this is actually a great opportunity not only to calculate what your compound return is for your education, your hypothetical education, right? This is also, uh, this lecture is basically an introduction for me to introduce you guys to the concept of R and to the basics of programming within R, right? So I use this as a whole, we go the roundabout way to go about and do the lab because it's just, we might as, well, I might as well, this is a great point for me to introduce um, our studio and to do all the, basically show you the concepts around it and the basic concepts between, uh, behind our programming. And uh, in, in all honesty, all, all types of analytics programming. We're just doing, we just happen to be doing it in R. So we want to calculate the compound return today. We're going to use R to do it. We're going to talk about the most basic data container in R. What's a data container? I'll get to that in a moment as well, which is a vector. We're going to talk about something in programming called for loops, if else statements, and then we're going to jump into lab one. All right, so from the introduction, this is the example I gave. I gave a hypothetical situation of a student at Rutgers that paid 11000 each year for their tuition. Now, this is the example I'm doing. You guys are going to do this example, and then you guys are going to do another example uh, that we'll talk about later in our Q&A session where I want you guys to basically... Uh, Put your own numbers in here and then calculate the compound returns. All right, make sure it works. So this fictional Rutgers student has paid $11,000 each year to go to Rutgers. All right, $11,000 each year to go to Rutgers. Now, hypothetically, this is how we want to think about the lab. Hypothetically, if the student didn't uh, pay Rutgers at $11,000, instead, they took that $11,000 and invested it in some sort of investment of some sorts. They gave a 10% return. How much would that student have made by the time of their graduation? All right. How, many how much would the student have made by the time of their graduation? Okay. So like in the introduction again, the first installment at freshman year was $11,000 for four years. It comes out if we compound it for four years comes out to $16,105.10. Now again, when we mean compound return, there's a difference between return and compound return, all right? The way, another, way to think about compound return again is that if you put your money in a bank account and you just leave it in that bank account and you're collecting interest every year, let's say 1% interest, you go year over year, year over year, year over every year, just letting it grow, that initial money you put in, right? After those 20 years or whatever time you put it in there, how much money do you have left? You see, that interest rate that your money is growing by every year, that's compound return. That's what we mean by compound return, right? And that's applied throughout all investments, not just bank account interest rates. It's every type of investment. We look at it in the lens of compound returns. That's what it's all about when you're investing, the comp having the highest compound return possible. So freshman year, you put in $11,000. Obviously, it's your freshman year. So for four years, that sucker is going to grow. At 10%, it comes out to 16,105. Sophomore year, you're putting in 11,000. Now, sophomore year, it's only going to grow for that 11,000 will only grow for three years, and it'll come out to $14,641. Junior year, you put in 11,000, it will only grow for two years. It becomes to $13,310. Senior year, you put in 11,000, it'll grow to just it'll just grow for one year at $12,100. All in, you total you put in $44,000 into this investment, just in different points in time. $11,000 in different points of time, but total $44,000. At the end of this investment, right, which typically would symbolize when you graduated from Rutgers, hypothetically, you would have $56,156.10. Woo, nice, right? Now, using this example, right, what is basically your first year salary, bonus salary, whatever, your first year compensation? What does that symbolize? That symbolizes whatever this amount is going to be right here, 
right? And for this particular hypothetical student. So, <clears throat> for example, if they receive 56,000, let's say they're getting, where were they, they they're, they're going to go work at a new up and coming ice cream store, high tech ice cream store, right? It's going to be coast to coast, awesome ice cream. You go in, you take it out, perfectly safe. Um, and they're being offered fifty six thousand one hundred fifty six dollars and ten cents. That's their that's their first year compensation. Well, then right off the bat, we know, bam, for this student, their compound return, off for their investment, for the money they invested in their tuition, it was ten percent. The compound return was ten percent for four years. All right. So you're expecting salary, obviously, the, the your tuition and your expecting salary. You can calculate what your implied compound return was. And then we can compare it to what the, what the alternative would have been actually in the markets. So let's start off with a simple example and do it in R. Now I will introduce you guys to R. Now when you open up R Studio, remember we downloaded two things. We downloaded R and R Studio. R Studio is what we use. It's a nice little ID that sits on top of R and does a lot of cool things for us. So here, I just jumped into this, but when you have R open, you're going to see this. Now, right now you will see three windows. You'll see what we have over here in this main window, and you'll see it's separated by two tabs, console and terminal. Console is which we're going to spend most of our time, actually probably like 99.99% .99 of our time. Up here you have a box called with three different tabs, and down here you have a box with five different tabs. You in R Studio can manipulate this as well. You can move this box over here, this box over here, et cetera, et cetera. As you get more comfortable, you'll have your own style of coding. You guys can customize our studio the way you want. All right. Here, the console. This is where all the code goes. So if I type in 2 plus 2, I type in enter, I get a 4. Right? Let me just make this a little bit bigger. So you guys can see it. All right. I get a 4 over there. It's like a big TID85 calculator, guys. Right, it's a big fancy TI TI85 calculator. Every time we run commands, it goes there and processes it. Now, I don't run my commands in the console. I could if I want, but that's not how we do our coding, programming, or scripting. It's, it becomes a little hectic if we use the console. Enter. The, see this green button over here with the arrow? Click on this, and you'll see this drop-down menu pop up. From here, we can choose different kind of files we want to work on within our studio and you guys see there's a rhtml here r sweep these are cool little things here there's something called a shiny web app that's a cool little thing that that's like a r's version of a web uh, a web page an interactive web page r markdown some you some people like using r markdown r notebook to do their work i'm just going to keep it simple and use dr script right here and this pops up right here now you have four windows now, you have something called Untitled over here. What is this? This is your R programming. In fact, um, you guys should create a folder for this class and save all your files, your programs, in that folder. This being our first lab, I'm going to save this file, and I will call it Lab 1. I will do literally Save As. Right, Go up here to File, just like you guys want a Word document, Excel document, PowerPoint document, whatever. File. Save as, and I'm going to go to my class folder, which I already created, Investment R, Summer 2020. And here, I'm going to call this lab underscore one, and I will save it. Ta-da! And you'll see magically, the name of the file now became lab underscore one dot R. Now, notice that extension, dot capital R. That is the extension now of every R program. Anytime there's an R script, R program, I use those terms interchangeably, those files will always have the dot capital R extension. Okay? If we go to a folder right here, all right, I go to my summer 20. There, it's kind of small here on my screen, but I don't know, can I make this bigger? Can I zoom in? I can't. All right, but you'll see here there's a file now called lab underscore one dot r. All right? And that's basically our R program. And if you go into your folder, you guys will see that as well. All right? And there it is. And this is where you do all that programming. Now I will do the same thing again here. I will do two plus two, just like I did before. And now I'm going to run it in this script, and it'll send this command over here and process it. Okay? 
So I will run the line here, but it'll send that line here in this console, the bottom console, and it'll process it. How do I do it? Okay. Well, you have a couple of these green arrow buttons over here that'll do it for you. Right? So this one, it runs the current line you're on. So because my cup when my, because my cursor was on line one, it'll run that line as you can see down here. When you ran that, when you click that button, this command 2 plus 2 was sent down here and the solution was given as well. And the solution was given as well. So 2 plus 2 was sent here plus the solution here. Now, some of you guys might be wondering, well, what the hell is this box? Bracket 1, bracket box. What's going on there? This is basically just giving you, telling you how many values came back. So because there's just a one there within those brackets, it's saying, listen, only one value came back, right? That's it. It's keeping track of how many values come back. When we have actually a lot of numbers, you'll see how, you'll see how this, this, this marker over here basically tells you which number position that number is. And I'll, get to, I'll show you guys that when we do that. So for now, this is just purely aesthetics. This is just purely aesthetics. This is the actual value right there, okay? Another way to run this, of course, if you want to, you can also highlight the line. And the highlighting really works a lot. I do the highlighting all the time when I'm running more than one line of code. And again, you could just run this green arrow right there. And it'll, again, send the line of code there and it'll process it. Okay. You have another one over here. And what this does is, uh, this, talk, this is a little more advanced. This reruns the previous code region, right? We can talk about that a little bit later. But what I like to do is, I like to do, when I have my cursor on this line, I like to, I'm on a Mac right now, so if I do command enter from my keyboard, automatically it sends the commands to the console. For my PCs, if you do control enter, it automatically runs that line. And if you have multiple lines, right now we just have one line, but whatever you highlight, if you have multiple lines of code, if you do command enter for Macs, it'll send those lines of code there. And for PCs, control enter, and it'll do the same thing, right? I obviously always do command enter, or for PCs, control enter. It's just much faster when you highlight it and run it. So that's basically how you run the code, right? And we did a, a very simple code. Notice, by the way, every few minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll press command or control S to save my file, right? Because remember, just like when you're working on R, I mean, on, on Word document in Excel, you want to you want to save your file every, every uh, couple of minutes. All right, so here. Back to the question at hand. I want to take this example right here, and I want to solve for this in R. I'm just going to basically just type it up like I would in R. Right? I would type it up just like I would in R. I have the code, how it looks down here. But go ahead and take the opportunity to type it in. Now, for my students that know programming or are comfortable with programming, right? you can pretty much eyeball a lot of this stuff, and you're like, yeah, I got it. It's good. For those of you that are new to programming or nervous about programming, I always recommend that you type along when you're reviewing the slides and the video. One, it breaks up the monotony. My, like I said before, my friends have seen these videos. Like five minutes in, they want to bash their brains in. They want to bash my head in because they're so boring. I apologize for that. It's a video. It's a, it's a technical video. right? I should put some special graphics in it. I just, we don't have the budget for that cool stuff yet, explosions and all that other stuff. So always, it helps break up the monotony, monotony of, of me talking and you staring at a blank screen, I mean staring at these uh, slides on the screen, by typing stuff in. And by the way, when you type stuff in, you're going to make mistakes, there's going to be errors, and that's truly where you learn. When you make these mistakes and you have to fix these mistakes or you come to me and I'll fix these mistakes for you, those nuances is how you're really going to learn. So I'm going to go ahead and just type this up in R. All right, I'll just go ahead and delete this. So for my example, it was 11,000. Notice 11,000, there's no commas. You can't put comma numbers in there for R, right? Just put the 11,000 times 1 plus 1.1 uh, or 1.1. It's going to be it's going to be 10% every year. So it's always 1 plus the rate of return, 1.1, all right? Or if you want, if you want to see it explicitly, you could do 1 plus 1.1. One, right? Plus, oh, sorry, I have to do this to the power of four years. This is for the freshmen. <clears throat> this is 
And this time I'm gonna just do the shortcut. Let's just do 1.3. That's for junior. Now I'm gonna just speed this up a little bit. Let's do copy. Sophomore and freshman. Let me scroll this over so you can see all of them in one side. All right. And here you can raise it to one or just not have raising to anything. It'll be by default, it'll be to the power of one. Now, interesting points. Notice, firstly, you must have the multiplication there, right? You cannot type this. You can't do this, all right? Yes, in mathematics, when we have a number next to another number in parentheses, that implies multiplication. But the multiplication command must be explicitly given between the parentheses, okay? So you must have that star there to represent multiplication. Now I put my cursor up here, press Command and Control Enter, and you'll see that line was sent here to the console, and I got my answer. Yay, excellent, you did your first R program. Not that hard, right? So this is the line of code you have right there, and that's what it is right here. That's how it's, it's, uh, that's how it's shown in your R script file. All right, from here, let us play around with our equation a little bit, all right? And now, I introduce you to a concept called data container, all right? Data container. Now, let's say, I have, here I have 10%, right? Let me, first of all, let me, let me alter this equation a little bit. I'll just copy it and move it down here so you have the original. I'm gonna alter this a little bit. And let's say hypothetically, jumping ahead of myself, <coughs> that here I don't wanna just calculate for 10% compound return, but I wanna play around with different possible numbers for compound returns instead of 10%, all right? Now what I could do is I could keep copying and pasting the equation and just going to these four points and changing them. I could change, you know, I could just go here and change that number, change that number, this number and that number, you get the gist. Yeah, but let's say hypothetically, instead of a four year calculation you're making, you're making a 20 year calculation. You're going to keep changing 20 values? Does that make sense? No. Remember, programming is here to make our life easier, not more complicated. Enter the concept of a data container. A variable of sorts that holds a value and that can be used in future calculations. Right? It's basically a container that holds a value that we can use as a value. All right, so let me show you this example right here. Here, I created a, I'm creating a, I'm gonna process this line right here, all right? When I do that, over here to your right, look what happens under environment tab, look what happens. The X shows up with the value 0.1 next to it. What's going on? What's going on is I just created a data container called X. That name, the variable name, it could be anything you want. Naruto, um, what else is in pop culture? God, I don't even know what the hell's going on in pop culture. Um, Avengers, I don't know, whatever, right? Name it anything you want, right? And that'll be that data container. Data containers are the whole point. In analytics, we're always dealing with data that we want to transform and summarize into some sort of results or measures that we can make some sort of decisions off of. That's the whole point. Here we have a very simple data container. Its name is X and it has one value. Okay, very simple. And you'll see throughout the semester, be it one value, one million values, it doesn't matter. Data containers hold our data in all different kinds of way, depending on a data container. Data containers start off with a very simple structure, as you see here, and they get more and more complicated. All right, so here, let's use this data container. Right here, I'm gonna transform this, 
and use this data container. All I'm going to do is now do instead of 1 plus 0.1, I'm going to do 1 plus x. Right? Think algebra. Think algebra, how you have those equations and you have variables that re represent a value or unknown value. Same sort of concept, except these variables actually have values. So here, Line four, when I run this, I get the result $56,156. Why? Because what happens is when you run this line, R sees there's numbers and there's our containers that exist already up here in your top right window. And it sees that. If it, let's say X did not exist, you'd get some sort of error. They'd be like, oh, X does not exist. What is X? All right? But because X is, exists, it knows exactly how to handle it. And it simply just takes the value within X plugs it into the equation, and it runs it. Why is this convenient? Because then we can just keep messing around with different values of x, right? And I can rerun line four again. Notice how line five is after line four, right? But yet I can go back and run line four, and when I rerun line four, it's gonna, have to, it's gonna use a new value of x. Because anytime you run that line, Anytime you run any kind of line of code or any code with a data container, it does not matter what order you run that line in. What matters is what is the present value of that data container. And as of now, as you can see up here, right, because after we executed line 5, up here in the top right window, x is now 0.2. So when I run line 4, I get the new, uh, if you want to call it, portfolio value or final value if let's say you invested 11,000 in four years. I love, I, if you invested 11000 each year for four years in a return that gave you 20% compound return, you'll notice it went to $70,857. All right, and so on, so on, so on. Or we can go even go backwards. We can say, or what is the value if it was invested in something that was 5% return? Boom. It becomes $49,781. And you guys can see... Up here, again, every, when I run that line X, it changed the value. Now, let us discuss this. First, let me go over this slide right here. Let me make it slightly smaller so you can see it. Okay, perfect. All right, so here, when you execute X, right? Again, it's a variable name. It is case sensitive, right? In R, it's case sensitive. Lowercase x is a data container that is different than an uppercase x. Case sensitivity matters, right? In line one, you notice I use that single equals to create the data container. And even over here in line five and six to change the values of the data container, okay? Now, I'm gonna run line five again and I want you to notice something. When I run line five, Line 5, the code from line 5 is sent down here and it's run. Notice there's no value afterwards. All that, is, all that happens is the, this line of code is sent down here and it's processed. But there's no output. See, unlike line 4, if I ran line 4, boom, line 4, this line of code is sent down here just like before, except slight difference here. The slight difference here is there's an output. There's an output what's going on, okay? The difference here is the single equals. I'm trying to highlight the single equals. The single equals, the single equals, the single equals. That single equals represents that you are doing one of two things. And this is a golden rule throughout the, throughout the semester. One of two things are happening when you're using that single equals. You're either creating or transforming a data container, okay? Either you're creating a data container that doesn't exist, that's what happened in line three. In line three, there was no X. When we executed that, boom, X popped up over here with the value. In line five and six, X does exist. So what's happening there, it's being, that data, existing data container is now being transformed into, to have a new value. That's what's happening with that single equals. And when that happens with that single equals, there is no result that will be shown down here in the console. Why? Because any potential results 
are being sent to the top right box, right here. They're just being sent here to change the value of the data container. If you want, it, from a visual point of view, obviously this is happening background in the background memory, but from a visual point of view, that's what's happening. That's why when you execute line three, five, or six, the line of code will be sent down here to the console, right? But there will be no output, as opposed to line four. In line four, we are having, we're using the data container. It's there. But what you'll notice is there's no single equals. We are not creating or changing the value of the data container. We are simply using it. And when you do that, the line of code is sent down here. And in addition, the output of that line of code is being given to you as well. That's the difference. That's the difference between you when you're creating or transforming a data container as opposed to just using a data container to, uh, to calculate some sort of measure or get some sort of a uh, result, right, from some sort of analysis. All right, and behind the scenes, visually, if you want to think about it, if you want to think about a point of view from like an Excel sheet, it's basically a cell somewhere that's being given the value 0.1, if we're using this example right here, and that cell is given, be, is, 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 uh, given the name X. So anytime you use X, R will go to the address of where X is and it'll grab that value and it'll use it. Okay, now, if hypothetically, you wanted to see what the value of that value X is, that's easy. Here, ladies and gentlemen, just type X. Just type the name of the data container, nothing more, nothing less. Process it, and down here, you'll see X was sent down here, and it gave you the current value. I mean, obviously, we know what the value is because it's on the top right window, but when we have much more complex data containers and you want to see some of the results or all the results, I mean, actually, you can't, for large data containers, you won't be able to see large results. You'll see that. You'll see that a little later in class, but um, here, if I just press X and process it, It'll give me the data container. Same way, I could just go straight to the console and just type in X, process, and it'll give me what the values in the data container. All right? So that's basically uh, how you would try to confirm, reconfirm what values in the data container, see what's there if you don't want to use the top right window. Right? You just call the data container by itself. And that's also the difference between when you use a single equals, basically when you're creating or transforming a data container, or when you're... Uh, or when you're just processing a value. I like to liken this to, I don't know how many of you guys watch anime. Every time I ask this question in class, I get like two or three people to raise their hands, right? A concept in a lot of anime is the concept of chakra, right? Where it's a chakra is considered like inner power, inner human body power. And in anime, when those people, those characters, they shoot out like laser bolts or whatever. Think of, if you watch the show Naruto, when he, do, when he does his Rasengan or whatever, all that other stuff. The concept is basically either you're storing data, I mean, you're storing chakra inside you, you're transforming it, and then you're shooting it out into some sort of new uh, weapon or something along those lines. It's the same thing with data analysis, right? We need to store data, which is what our data containers do, and then we need to be able to do transform the data, which is what the programming aspect of it is, right? And then we need to see the results, which is basically what the console allows us to do. The console and also uh, tables. We can also see the results in tables and graphs. We see the results in graphs as well. And we'll talk about that also, also later in the semester. Okay? Now, here, some of you guys already took, hopefully a lot of you guys, hopefully, I think hopefully most of you guys took your foundations, or at least the Bates students, right? So, so you guys already took Python. So there's a big difference, there's a, Big basic difference between R and Python in the sense of how data containers are stored and used. In R, the most basic, basic data container is a vector. Or if you want to think about it from a mathematics point of view, an array. All right, an array, an array of values. This x equals 0.1 that we created, this is a vector. x is a vector. But, or an array, if you want to think about it, but it's just a single value array. Single dimension, single value array or vector. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the most basic building block of R. 
Okay, unlike data types in Python, C, Java, etc., whatever, right? You ha you'll have those data structures. You will have arrays and uh, vectors and all that other jazz, right? But you also have data types. In R, they don't have that. In R, it's much more simple and basic. In R, everything is a vector. Everything is a vector. And because everything is a vector, you get a lot more flexibility that you wouldn't in Python. And some of you guys hate that flexibility when I ask you certain questions and because you go in Python mode, right? And it's a little different than Python and R. And I'll, I'll show you guys that, all right? First off, here's a visual representation of what's going on here, okay? If you think of a vector or an array, it's basically a bookshelf. It's a bookshelf. X is a bookshelf. In this case, X is a bookshelf, right? X is a bookshelf that has basically one shelf, one shelf. In this example right here, there's one, two, three, four shelves, right? Four shelves. But in our example, X is just one shelf, all right? The bookshelf is the vector. The books that go into the shelves are the data, are the data, right? And they hold the data for you. And this now opens up the syntax here. For those who are new to programming, this kind of syntax right here. What is going on right here? What is this X, open bracket, one, close bracket? What is going on? Okay, because X is a data container, again, think of a bookshelf, we might want access to the different shelves within that bookshelf. It just so happens, X just happens to be a one shelf bookshelf. All right, cool. So if I want to get to the access the value like I just showed you here, if I could simply just type in X. But I also can type in X, open bracket, close bracket. And if, again, if you do that, you'll notice both brackets pop up there and right in there, you put the one. And it gives you a point two, to, uh, a point two to, in this case, it's point two in my uh, example I'm doing here is point one. So don't get confused there. So what's going on here? Any time now, from now on, that's it. Any time now when you have a data container and an open bracket and some other numerics, and it's, this is getting, getting get very fancy. And anytime you have this open bracket, a number in here, and a close bracket, what you're saying now is give me the value from X, which is a book, which is a data container, i.e. a bookshelf, i.e. a vector, right? and give me the value in X at that position. Or the value of X at that particular shelf. In this case, the first shelf. All right? <coughs> that is what's happening there now. Give me the value at that shelf. The first shelf. And it just so happens X is just a one shelf value. So when we type in X right here, we just type in X right here, or as I showed you in the R code, it gives you point 0.1, and it gives you the bracket 1 bracket right next to it. You see that? When I type in X right here, it gives me the bracket 1 bracket right there, and it gives me the value, point 0.2. This is saying, hey, check it out. Um, here's all the values or in X. It's just, there's just one. I'm um, just a one-shelf data container, one-shelf bookshelf. And the, the value in that particular shelf in that position is 0.2. The numbers within these brackets are the position of the values in that data container. X right now is a single data container, has one position, has one value. Done. Okay? That's what that square brackets mean. Now, if you can understand that, then you can understand this. All right? Let's then take X. Let's grow that bad boy. All right, let's grow it. Let's make it a, let's add some more values to th that data container X, right? So here I think, what does I have? I have five, six, seven, all right, let's follow the example. So this will be five. What did I just do? What did I just do? Let me scribe, scroll over here, all right? And, see, and you can see over, over here what's going on here too. Now what I do is on the fly, look, notice what I have there, single equals. Again, ladies and gentlemen, when there's a single equals there, What's one of two things are happening? What's, what's the rule again? Either you're creating a new data container or you're transforming an existing data container, okay? In this case, I already have a data container called X. So what's happening is, is the latter. I am transforming that data container. 
So when you have the single equals here, there's an order of operations. The order of operations is you do the right side of the equals first, and then you do the left side of the equals. You'll, this is, you'll see why this is important when you, we start doing some of the practice set problems. All right? So here now, I say, what, let's, define, let's interpret what's going on. I'm saying make the second value of x, all right, make the second value of x. Right now, x only had, at this moment, x only had one value in it. But make the second value in x equal to 5. All right, I ran that code. Notice I ran that down here. And again, notice there's no output. Why is there no output? That output goes right up here to the top right, because again, we're, we're either creating or transforming a data container. And so now what happens is the second value of x now has 5. So the first value of x is still there at point 2. Again, and again, I want you to think about this in terms of bookshelves. So we start off with a bookshelf with just one value, x, and all of a sudden now we threw in a second bookshelf and we plopped in the value 5. We did that dynamically. We did that on the fly. And R lets you do that on the fly, dynamically. It lets you just throw in, it, even if it's at size 2 right now, it lets you throw in as many shelves out of nowhere you want and lets you put values in those shelves, whatever values you want. Okay? And this, again, is the most basic building block, the most basic data container in R. In R. And this concept just flows through with us through all the other more complex data containers that we will use. So here... Let me, kill, let me finish off the example. So here now I'm going to say, I'm going to on the fly, I'm going to create a third bookshelf, and I'm going to stick the value 6 in there. I'm going to create a fourth bookshelf, and I'm going to stick the value 7 in there. Or, I'm sorry. Boom. And as you can see over here, guys, to my right, as I do that, now what X is saying, it changed how it looked. It's now saying, look, this is a number, and it's basically a numeric vector. Basically, there's numbers in it. And it has four elements, one, one colon four, one to four, and these are the values, 0 0.2, 5, 6, 7. All right? So it's, it's changing before, the data container is changing right before our eyes as we're running the code right here, as we're running the code right here. And again, if I were to now, ladies and gentlemen, down here, do I do this here in the slide? I don't. Well, you can look at it right now. So for here, you can see the vector and array, it's growing. So now, after I ran these two, these three lines, my original one single value x has now become four values. And this is how it looks like. This is how it looks like. If I come down here, if I type in just a value x now like I did before, and run it, it gives me now what? Notice I, have, I typed in x, no brackets. When you just type in the x or any name of the data container and have none of the brackets, you're saying show me all the results of the data container. Or, or to follow our example, show me all the values of the bookshelf. Show me all the shelves of the bookshelf. It is not until I do x bracket 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, and I press enter, that it gives me a specific bookshelf value. See, if I don't use the square brackets, it's going to give me the whole bookshelf. But it's not until I start using the those square brackets that I hone in on the particular value of a particular shelf as opposed to the whole bookshelf. Okay? Or, if you want to talk about more mathematically now, the vector and array, right? Either you can view the whole vector and array, right? Or you can just view a particular value within, each, uh, within the vector. The first position of the vector, second position, third position, fourth position. All right? Visually, I usually show it like this. Visually, I always show it going across where this would be the first position, 5 would be the second position, 6 would be the third position, and 7 would be the fourth position. You can visualize it any way you want, just as long as you get the same right values. Now, let's execute this code, right? Here's a little practice run for you guys. What's going on here? Again, I have x1 equals 22. We do the right side first and the left side. Right side first is quite straightforward. I have a value 22 there. The left side, what's going on? The first value of x I want to create or transform to be 22. x already exists. Obviously it has its first shelf. And so all I'm doing now, I'm taking the first value of x and I'm overwriting it now to have the value 22. 
And it happens that easy. And it happens that easy. All right? Now, here we can get into some basic way to create vectors. Before we do that, I want to I want to go I want to go a little bit further, explain some other things that are on the slide for you. Here we have x if I do I type in x, <coughs> I have four values, right? Let's say now I would do if I typed in x5. What do you think would happen? Right? What do you think would happen? At this point you're probably just going to type it in and see what happens. But you don't get an error. What you do get is an N A. Not available. Or what do you want to call it? Whatever you want to call it. The N A's, right, in R and R are the nulls. That's basically saying null. There's nothing there. There is no fifth shelf of X X. And subsequently, there is no value for the fifth shelf of X. It doesn't exist. It's null. Um, in Python, you guys will recall it's N A N. Null is tends to be uh, N A N, and especially if you did pandas, it tends to be it's N A N. All right. So if that's the case, right? What if I did this now? X of six equals let's say ten. Now what's going to happen? If you process this, you are you doing you're getting an error? You think it's going to process it? What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Boom. Now in NumPy, for those of you guys, again, my foundations people, you know you'll get an error. Not so with R. R is very flexible. Notice I ran line 15. It ran it, it processed it. What the hell just happened? Type in X, you can see for yourself. It simply went to the it, what it did was it said, okay, there's four shelves, but you're saying create a sixth shelf and put the value 10 in it. R is like, in NumPy, you get an error right off the way. Up NumPy, like, you're crazy. What the hell are you doing, right? In Python. Not so in R. R is very flexible. R is like, all right, cool. You want, you want a sixth shelf and you want 10 there. All right, fine. Sounds good. So what R will do is it will create that 10th, fifth shelf. It will put the null in there. Hey, there's a fifth shelf. There's null. Then it'll create the six shelf and I'll put the value 10 there. You see? And that's why you get something like that. It is very literal. It is very literal and very flexible with what you want to do with the data. Right? It's very flexible and very literal. You want the tenth, the uh, you want the value 10 in the sixth position of X? No problem. It's gonna do it. It'll just create a it'll just create a null for the fifth value because again, we never specified it to have a value in the fifth position. And it'll just go and skip to the sixth position and give it the value 10. See the flexibility? This is why, personally, I always use R when I do analysis, unless I have to do Python, which tends to be a lot, especially when I'm working on uh, web stuff. Web stuff, I mean, when it comes to building websites or doing any kind of web analytics, anything web-wise, I'm always forced to do stuff in Python. I, I personally use the, the Flask framework, because I'll do lightweight websites and web apps, as opposed to Django, which is, the enterprise level and it just gets it gets uh, a lot more crazy but you know you can use either or but I just prefer flats because it's a little bit it's more work in the end but when you want to get started off doing something it's 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 pretty fast getting off the ground all right so let's now jump into creating vectors like how, other ways to possibly create vectors and here I, I show you some more functionality of R that we tend to use a lot that we tend to use a lot So now, these functionalities, uh, they're the basic functionalities of R. You'll be using them throughout the semester. You'll be using them throughout R. And we start off with a creating a vector, random vector of values 45, 2, negative 8, 10, and 1, right? And we use this function called the C function. This C function, right, you see right here, you see the letter C, and you see the parentheses around it. Now, I just threw a definition in there. What is that? A? Okay, it's A. A equals C, all right? Now, before I, I showed you the concept of brackets next to the data containers when we want to look at certain values, now I'm showing you the concept of parentheses, okay? When you see parentheses in R and Python, you're using something called a function, a function. What is a function? A function is 
a pre is a uh, a predefined set of codes that's already programmed in R. That's already programmed in R, and we can call those predefined set of functions when we call the name of the function and the two parentheses, opening and closing parentheses after it. Okay. So what's the set of code happening here? This C function, by the way, and this is a very weird concept. The C function is a very weird concept. We use it in so many different ways. This is the equivalent in Python to the double brackets. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about because you guys haven't done any coding, you'll know if you, when you dabble in some Python, right? So the C function is a very weird concept. It doesn't exist in other coding languages. This is an R specific thing. And you gotta just get used to this. You gotta just get used to this, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll guide you as you use the C function, but very strange. It's a very strange cat. So the C over here stands for basically um, combine or concatenate or column, right? We can call it each one, one, of, one of those things, right? But that's why it's C. That's why it's C. Now, when I put the values, oh, let's see if I can copy this, put directly in there. Boom. All right, perfect. When I put these values in here, right, what happens is A is defined, you look up, up here, boom, a new data container A is made. I type in A over here to see what's in it, and you'll see it's a vector 45, 2, negative 8, 10, 1. Now, first things first, it has five values, but over here it still has that single bracket one thing going on. What's going on there? Remember I said before, this is for aesthetics purposes. This is basically saying, hey, this 45 right there, that's the first value. Okay, that's all it's saying. That 45 is the first value. And from that, you can imply, okay, 2 is the second value, negative 8 is the third, 10 is the fourth value, 1 is the fifth value, etc., etc., etc. All right? So from here, uh, from here, what was the predefined code that happened back in the background? Like, what did C do? What did C do? Right? Notice, by the way, each one of these numbers I separated by a comma. 45, 2, negative 8, 10, 1. So we basically created this vector or this bookshelf of values all in one shot. Now, what's the code that happened behind the scenes? Basically, the code that happened behind the scenes was a of 1 equals 45, a of 2 equals 2. Just copy this to make it faster. negative 8, a of 4 equals 10, and a of 5 equals 1. All right, so basically these five lines of code are basically what happened, what happened behind the scenes when I ran C parentheses these values. It took the values within this parentheses, and by the way, the values that go within the parentheses, those are called parameters. Those are the parameters of the function. Those are the parameters of the function. In this case, this function call had five parameters. The C function had called five parameters. It took those five parameters and it basically executed these five lines of code right here. All right. So that's the code that ran behind the scenes. We just go went ahead and did it in one line. You tell me which one you prefer. I know which one I would prefer to use. So that C function, boom, it created this vector called A with those with these values right here, with these values right here. All right, so that's the C function. All right, now, another cool little function in R we use a lot is the colon, is the colon. What pray tell does the colon do? The colon also creates a vector. One colon five, it creates a sequential vector. One, two, three, four, five, okay? So B equals, and again, for the new programmers, follow along. Okay, get comfortable with this, right? Have a little fun. You process B, you get the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's synchronous, right? So that's the B vector. That's what the colon does. It creates a sequential vector, starting from 1, including the 5. For my Python people, 5 is inclusive. Why? You guys remember, whoever took Python, you remember in Python, 5 and NumPy, 5 would be exclusive, right? Why do they do it in Python? Because Python is stupid. Right? I have no idea why they would do that in Python. It doesn't make any sense. But remember, R is written for human beings by human beings. And also, you will notice something else for people that have done Python. 
that I didn't really explicitly say, but let's talk about it right now. Unlike every other, including Python, every other programming language, Java, C, C++, Perl, Python, the first value in R is not zero. It's not zero, it is one. Why is it one? Because, damn it, it is a, it's a written, it's a language written for human beings by human beings. That's why, the first value is one. It's not zero. And that's, older, another, that's also another major difference between Python and R. All right, so boom, we have our different values. Now, oh, I didn't have the counterexample here. Let me show you the counterexample here. Let me create another vector, b2 equals 5 colon 1. I process this. What do you guys, what do you guys think b2 is going to be, guys? It's going to be 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Going from 5 to 1 in increments of 1. Okay? So you can do it from uh, less to high, high to less. doesn't matter. Very flexible. All right. And now we're going to show you this new phone. Um, again, I, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for this. I, I created a variable called C, which you can do, but I don't want you guys to get confused with the C function. But R can tell the difference between a C variable and a C function. So we'll just roll with it. So there's another function here called REP. Notice the parentheses, open parentheses, close parentheses, two parameters. This time just two parameters. What does REP do? Well, REP stands for repeat. And what it does is it creates a vector, in this case it's going to be defined to be C, that's going to be three repeating five times. Three repeating five times. Pretty cool, huh? So this will create a vector 333. Three, three. Sorry. C equals C equals repeat three. Notice by the way when I pop in that function, notice you get a nice drop down. R Studio gives you a nice drop down of all the different functions available to you guys. Really cool, really nice. So R E P three five. Boom, I type in C right here. And I have the vector 333. All right, <clears throat> another function, SEQ. This stands for sequence. Sequence pretty much works the same way the colon works, but sequence gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of the interval, the interval you're, growing, you're, you're, uh, you're stepping at. So here, I want to create a vector that goes from 2 to 10, but instead of, incre instead of incrementally, by one is going incrementally by two. So that's what this basically means. Create a vector that goes from two to 10, inclusively again, my Python people, and you want to step in values of two. Step in values of two. All right, let me go ahead and grab this. D, a boom. Two, four, six, eight, ten. All right. Also, you can do the other way. The only difference here is if I went from ten to two, and I did two here, this would give you an error, right? Now, why is it giving you an error? Because when you're stepping from ten to two, you can't go in twos, right? If you go in twos, you're just going higher, higher, higher. You want to go lower. So the right way to do this is to put in negative two. Put in negative two. Boom, right? So now it's going to go from 10, negative 2 gives you 8, negative 2 gives you 6, etc., etc. And that's how you get from 10 to 2 in steps of negative 2, 10, 8, 6, 10, 8, 6 4, 2. All right? Another cool feature of the sequences, and here, by the way, when you're working with simulations, I don't know if there's any math guys or um, math or stats guys here, but when you're definitely, obviously, in the quantitative world, the, fun, the stock world, in the financial world, we do simulations a lot. When you're dealing with simulations, this sequence thing gets it's really cool because you can actually uh, do it in steps of less than one as well. For example, let's say I did from 
let's say d3 equals sequence. Um, let's do 2 to 10. Instead of in steps of 1, I can go smaller. I can say, all right, cool, let's do steps of 0.01. I'll run this. And I type in D3. Boom! Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Eh? Look at all these values that come up. Starting with 2, and now in steps of 0.01, going all the way down, all the way to 10. Now, let's talk about this a little bit, because this gives me an opportunity to talk about the aesthetics on the left side here, all right? So again, you see these numbers here, and by the way, don't freak out when your numbers are different than mine here, because again, this is aesthetics. This has to do with the, your font size, how much, how much, how big your bottom window is, right? This is this is what dictates what these numbers are. This number right here, it's saying this two is the first value in the vector. This one is saying. This 2.09 is the 10th value in the vector. This 19 is saying this is the 19th value in the vector, and so on, and so on, and so on. This, these numbers, again, are aesthetics, are, aesthetic, are there for aesthetic purposes. They're there so you can actually count up which number a specific one is. For example, if I wanted to know is what position is this number in, in, the, in this vector, D3, I would simply go to its row, see that this is 73, this is 73, this is the 74th position, this will be the 75th position, 76th position, and then boom, 2.76 is there for the 77th position. All right, three, four, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, 77th position. That's how, this is how this is the four, this is the purposes between these, uh, this is the purpose for these numbers over here. And again, you're gonna have a different type of grid inside, depending on your font size and your window size and your computer screen size, all, all that stuff. So that's the point behind it. All right, so that's the sequence function. And the sequence function, again, is very versatile, very flexible, allows you to do create tremendous amount of uh, vectors, size vectors, for any kind of specification you want, for any kind of specification you want. So the next function, and here we have a slight example for you guys. To work with. So here, I give you a little question right here to see if you guys understand what's going on. All right, see if you can do this. See, oh, but I mean, I basically I give you the question, I give you the answer. So, uh, so, but see, understand why you get the answer. So if I were to give you this, all right, as I say, hey, a e equals this monstrosity. The answer is this vector right here. This is what e would be. Can you follow it, and can you see how that happens? First off, firstly, notice we're using the C function right here. Here's the opening parenthesis of the C function. Here's the closing parenthesis of the C function. But what you also notice is within the C function, we have several different parameters. All of them are not numbers. Look at this. Number here, number here, and bam. The third parameter is not a number. The third parameter is 3 colon 1. It's a vector. We just talked about this. This is a vector of 3, 2, 1. The fourth parameter is another vector that's going to repeat three two times. It's another vector, two, two. This is another vector using the sequence function. You're going from one to seven <coughs> in steps of three. And finally, the fourth parameter, look at this, is another C function within a C function. That's okay, that's fine. This C function right here creates a vector of two, four, five. That's going to be within this C function. Now, what's going on here? The C function is flexible with both numbers and other vector data containers. So what ends up happening here is within the C function, you can give it a combination of numbers, vectors, whatever, like numbers or vectors, as many as you want, and it will simply take, create, take all the values from the numbers and the vectors and make one giant vector out of it. And that's what happened here. It created one giant vector. So this vector now is going to be 55, 27, straightforward. 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1. Repeating 3 2 times, 1, 2. Sequence 1 to 7, seven steps of 3, 1, 4, 7. That's this part right here. The 1, 4, 7 is this part right here. And then finally, this part right here is going to be another sub vector that'll just be 2, 4, 5. And some of my students ask, they're like, hey, Professor, we didn't need the C function here, right? We could have just simply just put 
2, 4, 5 outside the C function. And that's correct. You could have done that. It would have created the same result. I just wanted to show you that you can have these functions, these C functions, especially the C functions, can be nested within one another. Nested within one another. And the ending result will be the same thing. A vector. A vector. Because the C function, right, no matter what parameters you give it within the parentheses, it creates a vector. It creates a vector. All right? All right, so that's basically, uh, we'll call it the intro to the vectors, right? Obviously, there's a little more to it, and we'll slowly add to our arsenal as we go on through the semester. Now, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about something that, there's two things I'm going to talk about uh, that are basic to not just R, but any, every programming concept, if-else statements and for loops. Now, for those of you that took um, CompSci 111, you should be familiar with this. For those of you that took computer applications, why did you take computer applications? You should have took CompSci 111, right? But nevertheless, well, I'll go over it right now. So what is a, we'll start off with the if-else statement. Well, what is the if-else statement? The if-else statement is basically how we allow our programs to make decisions based on some sort of condition, right? Uh, a condition could be something as simple as, I mean, if you think about it from Excel, you guys, some of you guys have messed around with the else if functionality in Excel. Same concept, same concept. So basically what's happening here is I have a condition, right? And based on whether this condition, and these conditions, by the way, can either be true or false, right? It's true or false, that's it. And a simple condition would be is, you know, is this variable equal to five or is this variable greater than five, whatever. And then notice the squiggly braces right here. Squiggly braces, squiggly braces, squiggly braces, right? If this condition is true, then the code that is within this squiggly brace and that squiggly brace will happen. If this code is false, whatever this line of code is within the parentheses, then this part is skipped and then whatever code was within the else squiggly brace, open brace and close brace, that code will be happen. And that means expression two. All right, so that's basically the concept of if else statements. Now, First of all, firstly, for those students that already took foundations, notice that there is no tabbing. We don't do tabbing like in Python. Here we, we have the squiggly brace systems like they do in Java and C and C++. All right. Now, from a diagram, from a, diagram, from a visual point of view, this is basically what's happening. You start, you, enter, you start by entering the condition. Boom, this part, right? Is the condition true or not? If it's true, you execute the code that's within the if, this part. And then you go outside the code. You exit the code and do the rest of the code. If it's false, then you do the code in the else. You do that, and then you exit out the code and do the rest of the code after the if-else statement. Notice it's either one or the other. That's the whole deal with the if-else statement. You will never have a situation where both codes get executed. Only one can happen. Only one can happen. The example I give is, at least in the state of New Jersey, when you marry somebody, you can only marry one other person. That's it. You can only want to marry one other person. At least in at least in New Jersey, right? It's one and that's it. One and that's it. Only one. No matter how many shooters you have, right? Bait ladies, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? No matter how many shooters you have, you can only marry one. So that's the whole point of the if-else statement. All right, here's an example. I start off with a, oh, this is, I have a slight typo, by the way, here. Let me rewrite this. I'm going to rewrite this in R. But basically, let's see, we have quantity equals 25, else, quantity, okay, cool. If this variable, and by the way, guys, when you write this, sorry, I, I can't write for some reason. Notice the if part is purple. The reason why it's a different color because it's a keyword with an R. And basically, this means that um, this thing if basically means it's something special within the R code, and it is. It's a if else statement, All right? If quantity, sorry, I didn't make something logical. If quantity is greater than 20, 
I think that's my, that's what I have there. I'm going to print something. I'm going to print a statement. You sold a lot. Else, now the else, this is the only typo I have. The else must start at the last brace right here. So that's what I meant. I have a typo on that slide. So this is the right way to do it right here. This is the right way to write this. The else must go on the brace over there. Unless you'll, uh, if you don't, you'll get an error. It's strange. And I believe the command I gave not enough for today. All right, boom. <coughs> and you don't have to tab it in. I like tabbing it in just because it's easier to read, right? Tabbing is, is, is you don't have to tab it because it doesn't, um, that's Python, it's not R. As long as it's within the squiggly braces, that's fine. Now, when you run this, you can't run it line by line. You have to highlight the whole, well, line 40 if you want to. Line 40, you can do it individually. But everything else, all the other if else statements, everything that's part of it must be done all at once, right? So I'm going to do this, execute this. And you'll see that the whole code was sent down here, all right? And you got the result, you sold a lot. Why did I get back, you sold a lot, and not, not enough for today? Why did I only get one line? It's because quant tw quantity is 25. In here, it's doing a logical check. It's asking, hey, is quantity greater than 20? Well, what's in quantity? Quantity has the value 25. Is 25 greater than 20? Yes, it is. That, this, therefore, this statement, logical statement, is true. Because this was true, then whatever is within the first quickly braces will be executed. You can have as many lines as you want. Here we have one line, you can have 1,000 lines, doesn't matter. Whatever is in that the first set of squiggly braces will be executed. And then the second part will be skipped. That's it. And that's why we got you sold a lot. Now, this is important for some of you people. Uh, some of you guys might have done a partial highlighting and ran it. And then you see something down here. You see this plus down here. And you're going to start typing your thing and start typing thing. And you just keep getting this plus and you're like, what happened? I broke R. You didn't break R. That plus basically means this is waiting for more commands. You gave an incomplete command to R and it had, it's waiting for more commands. The simplest way to just get around this is just press escape, people. Just get escape and you get that little arrow thing back and you're back. All right. This is a common mistake that people new to R do and they start freaking out. Just press escape and you're back. Right. And then you can go back and highlight all the code you want. And do it the right way, right? And do it the right way. So at this point, we got this result. Now let's tweak the value for quantity and rerun it. Let's let's tweak it and rerun it. So now I'm going to the same code. Let me just make it slightly bigger. Instead of 25, I'll make it 20. All right. I'm gonna re, I'm gonna re I'm gonna change the value. Transform the value of, uh, or Update the value in quantity. Notice again down here, it went down here, quantity. There's no output because we are transforming a data container, like I said before. Now I'm gonna highlight this again, same code. Boom. And now all those lines from 41 to 47 were sent down here in the console and it was processed. And now I got a different result. I got the result not enough for today. Why? Same thing, it went down here, to line 41, it said, hey, it checked this condition. Is 20 greater than 20? 20 is not greater than 20. That is false. Because this is false, anything within the first squiggly braces is skipped and it goes straight down to else and executes anything within the squiggly braces of else. Just like before, it could be one line, 1,000 lines, doesn't matter. Everything in those squiggly braces of else will be executed, which is just this. And the statement is printed right here, not enough for today, right? And that's basically your if else. Very straightforward, right? Very straightforward, but very powerful. This is how your programs, this is how you program your, pro, your uh, you code your programs to make decisions. This is how it's done. All right, now, let's talk about for loops. Let's set up the conversation to talk about for loops. All right, because usually if else statements and for loops go hand in hand. Now we try to avoid if else statements and for loops by doing uh, something else that's specific to R, and actually it's specific to NumPy too, because NumPy obviously ripped off. NumPy ripped off R, 
and pandas is a ripoff and actually made R better. And then there's something else called data tables that ripped off pandas, which we use, by the way, in this class. It's actually the industry standard. Um, so those, both those things, there's something called vector mathematics or vector, fun vector functionality. And we'll get to that. But for now, let's say I have this vector A. And to this vector A, right, I want to add 5 to every element in it. So A is going to be 6 colon 1. You guys know what kind of vector that is? That's going to be 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Done. To every element in A, I want to add 5. So here, ladies and gentlemen, I literally am going from element to element, adding 5. Now, again, this is a little funky for some of you guys, right? So I just want to, I just want to explain what's going on. Remember, you have a single equals there. That means one of two things. Either I'm creating a new data container or transforming an existing data container. A already exists. As of line one, a, after line one, A exists. So in line two, I'm transforming a value in A. Okay? Now, here, you have A of one here, you have A of one here, and for new programmers, this is system, you, you go into a system overload, you're like, what the hell does that mean? What do I do? Remember your order of operations. Remember your order of operations. When you have a single equals, there's an order of operations. You do the right side first, then you do the left side. Okay, so in this situation, what is the right side? Well, what is A bracket 1 bracket? Again, as a refresher, whenever you have the square brackets after a data container, you're looking at a particular value from a shelf. Which shelf? It's the number within the square brackets. So this is basically saying, give me the value of the first value in this shelf. The first value of A is 6. This A of 1 represents 6. Okay? 6 plus 5. Now we can go into the, to the second part. 6 plus 5 is what? It's 11. Aha! The right side of the equals represents the number 11. Be it in an equation, it doesn't matter. This is representing the value 11. Done. Now we do the left side. The left side of the value is now saying A bracket 1 close bracket equals 11. So what does that mean? What is what is a of 1 equal 11 going to be? You know what that's going to be. It's overriding the first value of a to be 11. That's what's happening. Boom. Now, if we type in a down here. You have 11, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, right? And that's what's happening going down the line, going down the line. Here, the second value is being appended by 5, the third value, the fourth, the fifth value, the sixth value, et cetera, et cetera. All right, if we ran all that, all that down, let me just quickly do that for you guys. All right, we'll do a little copy paste action and make things faster. I actually could have copied. There's one more. I should have just actually copied it from the slide, but whatever. Now I type in A over here, and I have 11, oh, oops, sorry, what do I have a weird value for? 11, 10, 9, 3, 13, 6. I have a mistake here somewhere. Oh, right here, guys. Uh, sorry, let me do this again. All right, now I got A, and now everything's right. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. So as you can see, we added 5 to every value. We added 5 to all the values in the original vector 6 to 1. All right? Fantastic. Great. Now, <clears throat> what if I had a, with this vector, vector A 
instead of six values, it had a thousand numbers or 10,000 numbers. Am I going to write 1,000 lines of code or 10,000 lines of code? You must be ridiculous. Programming is here to make our life easier. Remember that coding is supposed to be making your life a lot easier. All right, this is where the concept of for loops comes in. It's a mechanism in every programming language to loop through the vector or any, or any list of arrays, a list of values, and then execute any number of lines of code on each list of values or using any list of values. All right, here is the basic structure. Actually, before we even jump into this, let me show you the basic structure of a for loop. Here's the four. There. This is the basic skeleton of a for loop. This is the basic skeleton of a for loop. All right. Here now, I'm going to add, firstly, within the parentheses, I'm going to add two things. The first thing I'm going to add, let's start with the original A. Six colon one. Uh, let's do something simple. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Six colon one is fine. All right. So let's say I have this vector six colon one. Okay. Now I start off with the right the right side of n. The right side of n. I place my vector that I'm going to iterate through. That's easy. It's going to be a done. All right. The left side of the vector. I am going to place what I call the iterator. The iterator is just a variable name. It can be anything you want it to be, right? As long as you, you just have to use it consistently. Well, so for example, what if I put I in here? Any variable name. You could put I, any name you could think of. It's a variable name. So what is the iterator here? What does this do, I? What happens here is that, and then the code within the squiggly braces, I'm saying basically just print I, all right? So whatever code you want to have happen, it happens with the squiggly braces. So what's happening with the for loop is this: the for loop is going to have as is going to have as many iterations as there are values in A. I have how many values in A? Six, five, four, three, two, one. I have six values in A. Therefore, I'm going to have six loops. This thing is going to loop six times. In each iteration of the loop. I will become a different value in A in order from left to right. So if this is A down here, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, then in the first loop, I will become 6. In the second loop, I will become 5. In the third loop, I will become 4. In the fourth loop, I will become 3, and so on, and so on, and so on. It goes from left to, uh, to right of the values in the vector of A. So when I run this function right here, I run this for loop. Boom. You will see that it printed 654321. 1. All right. That is the for loop. And again, you can have as many codes as you want over here. You can have as many codes as you want in here. Like for example, here I can add two lines of code. I can say create a new variable on the fly it's called x, and x is now going to be i plus 5, right? And then here I can say, instead of print i, I can say print x, all right? So now what's going to happen? Right now what's going to happen? What's going to happen is, on the first loop, I will take on the value, let me type in a over here, in the first loop, I will take on the value of 6. I come down to line 61, i plus 5 will literally become 6 plus 5, 11. x will then become the value 11, because x is going to equal, a new data container x will be will created within the for loop, and then x will be created, will be 11. And then I'm going to print whatever is in x, so 11 will be printed. We get down here, i starts over, but this time i is now going to be the next value in, in a, which is 5, comes down here, and it goes on. All right, so if I run this, now I'm going to get the values 11, 10, 9, 8, seven, six. All right. That is a for loop. It iterates through a vector of your choosing with the iterator 
of your naming and it does some stuff. It does some stuff. You will see we avoid for loops, all right, but there are situations where we do need it and you will see that come into play. All right, you'll see that come into play. Um, at this point, I will end video one because I like to keep my videos, I try to keep my videos at an hour, 20 minutes, right, to mimic basically the classes, the class time of a, of a normal semester, right? Hour, we always have classes in hour, 20 increments. So we're, I'm approaching hour and 20 minutes at this point. So at this point, I will end this video and then we'll do part B. We'll finish off the slides in part B of our video. All right, so I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye-bye.